Welcome to Mesa College, and uh, thank you for coming to see our show, Borders of Intimacy, Patricia Frischer and Cheryl Tall. I, before I introduce them, I want to say that um, our exhibits are very much of a collaboration. Besides being the gallery director here, I'm also a professor, and I teach the museum studies classes. And the class works with me, and we um, work a lot on the preparation, installation, lighting. They participate in all those different aspects of, of putting an exhibit together. So I want to thank, I don't think any of my students are here, but I, I do want to, oh yes, there's somebody back there. I do want to uh, say how, uh, that I, I thank them for, for their work. Um, this show is very exciting. About two years ago, Cheryl and Patricia came to me with this idea of a collaboration uh, based on a concept of uh, intimacy and relationships and the borders and boundaries that we try to establish. The, uh, the very uh, difficult balance between trying to keep your own individuality and also trying to share with another. And as they spoke about their idea and about this, this concept of collaborating, I think they also entered in, the, in a kind of relationship, a uh, give and take. Um, I liked their work individually, and um, so I was very um, excited to see what would uh, come from that dialogue between the two. Um, and if you go to the show, you will see that actually recorded in the binders in, in, in the exhibit. Um, and I won't say too much more because I do want to let the artists talk about the exhibit, but I just also want to uh, thank them for bringing us their show. And um, I think we'll be Patricia is going to begin. Yes. Oh, my name is Alessandra Moctezuma. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You turn off the lights, will I be able to see? Um, before, um, before we start the formal slide presentation, Cheryl and I would like to, um, to talk a little bit about collaborations and thank a few people that were so helpful to us. Um, first of all, when you collaborate on, um, on any show, you have to thank, uh, of course, your partner in that collaboration. And for me, that's to thank Cheryl, who did such a fantastic job. She's the one that actually introduced the idea of Borders of Intimacy to um, Alexandra and got the ball rolling. Um, our collaboration with both Alexandra and Pat Vine has been absolutely unbelievable. No one could ask for a more professional team to work with to put on the exhibition. And um, as Wendy Richmond said at earlier on, the sign of a really wonderful uh, designed exhibition is that you don't even realize um, how much design effort went into it. It's that flawless. But I would like to point out a few of the things that they did to make the exhibition so, um, so beautiful. They put up new walls. They bought new lights so that the reflections of the sculptures would not interfere with the uh, works on the art uh, on the wall. Um, they they uh, went out of the way to choose colors for some of the walls. They um, built that shelf for the for the words to rest on. Um, they um, they even coordinated the food for the party with um, some of the artwork in the show, which we'll explain later. 
Um, they helped us choose music. They, they just gave a total complete package and so our thanks go to them for um, a really terrific collaboration. We, we also want to thank our husbands, of course, who are great collaborators with us. They, we're lucky to have husbands who both re respect and um, support everything that we do in, in the arts. Um, we also like to thank the press that has been extremely kind to us and already um, we've had several reviews of the show and hopefully we'll have even more. Um, but um, I think the most important thing that I can say in this section um, as we begin to talk about our work to you and we will um, have quite a, a lot of emphasis on process um, is that the most important collaboration is that that you make yourself with yourself, with the artwork, because really the meaning of the artworks is um, is something that you have to create for yourself. We um, we probably have our own personal meanings, but if you don't make the effort to look at the artwork and to ask yourself questions about it and to have a relationship with it, then you don't really fully um, have the experience of seeing the show. So we encourage all of you to of course, listen to the lecture and what we say, but never have that be more important than how you feel directly about the art yourself. Um, I'm going to be um, making a few comments uh, uh, about um, um, my work and the process, but first um, we've decided that we're going to go back and forth. It's a little bit awkward, I know, but we're going to go back and forth with the demonstration. So Cheryl's going to come up first and do an introduction of her, of her work for you. I'd like to start with a quote uh, from Queen Victoria of England. I would venture to warn against too great intimacy with artists, as it is very seductive and a little dangerous. And this was written in a, a letter to her daughter, the Crown Princess of Prussia. Uh, so art can be a little dangerous and seductive. Uh, the idea for this show started even longer than two years ago. Uh, it started in 1996. I met with a group of people in Pittsburgh and uh, we were brainstorming about the idea of borders of intimacy, how close is too close, how can we connect with other people yet still maintain a certain boundary. Uh, we toyed with the idea of having an exhibition and uh, one thing led to another and it didn't actually happen. But this idea stayed in my mind. And then when I met Patricia a couple of years ago and saw the wonderful work that she was doing and uh, she was working on her sacred and profane series and uh, handcuffs and wedding rings and lingerie and uh, I was working on a couple series and uh, also uh, house and body architecture, how we relate to the buildings that we live in and the relationships that we have in these buildings. Uh, it just seemed like a perfect match and uh, we presented the idea and got accepted and then we started our brainstorming which uh, I really enjoyed. Uh, I would come home from our meetings very excited and, and tell Bruce that, oh, we talked about this and we talked about that, public and private and double dipping. And uh, it, it was um, an interesting process. And we actually experimented somewhat with each other's media. Um, Patricia did some clay work in my studio and I did some 2D work in her studio. We also um, sent emails back and forth with pictures uh, that we altered in Photoshop and I would like to do more of that. Um, the whole process was very interesting and of course the fruit of our labors, to see the fruit of our labors uh, in the wonderful gallery setting uh, is, is the grand finale, uh, not even really the finale because it goes on to another show in England. Uh, I'd like to talk also a little bit about my personal clay process. Um, this is a piece in the show called Secret Keeper. This, you see uh, how it's built in sections 
It's built uh, by a coil pinch method. Every mark you see there is a finger mark. The, the blue is paper, which is used to separate the wet clay uh, so that it doesn't stick together during, during the forming process. I'm frequently asked how long does it take me to make a sculpture. It takes um, from three to six weeks, generally. And all the colors are fired on in the kiln. This shows working on the final layer. Once the piece is finished, it's dried for up to three weeks and painted with slips, oxides, terra sigillata, on gobes, glazes, all in the greenware state, and then once fired in an electric kiln. This piece is also in the show. Uh, this is uh, from the couple series, and it's made of indigenous clay from Mexico. I was at, in an artist's residency in Mexico, and it's uh, made from native terracotta. And uh, now I'll let Patricia talk about her process. As Cheryl said, um, I was already working on a, a series called Sacred and Profane. And when you see the works in the show, there are several of these pieces that were created um, um, before Cheryl and I started working together. Um, one of the reasons um, I was so excited to work on this show is um, that the Sacred Show and the title Borders of Intimacy interlock so beautifully together. The Sacred and Profane show, uh, the series that I'm working on has been ongoing for about three or four years and the pieces are really um, all about challenging what one person thinks is sacred, another thinks is profane, and vice versa in all sorts of different ways. And so um, th those contrasts as, you know, lend themselves so easily to the ideas of borders of intimacy. You can see here that, th that the frames are very important in my work and I often work in um, multiples. Um, I don't have um, uh, any multiple works in this series because in the, in the Borders of Intimacy series, I, I don't think, because we're already working with so many layers and so many collaborations and so many complexities, it seems like it was e e easier to just stop at this point and to, and to work on individual pieces. Um, this is the piece that, um, this is one of the first pieces that I made when um, I started to work after a period when I was quite ill. And um, it's called The Second Coming. And um, I wanted to put it, stick it in right here because it is a transition piece for me between one series and the next series in time. Um, it's, uh, you will notice in a lot of my works that there are references to films. And this image actually comes um, out of a film reference, um, an old black and white film, even though I've slightly colorized this particular image. The first time that I actually was able to work with Cheryl in her studio was a marvelous, marvelous day for me. I had been working um, for about a year on my back with the computer on my lap, and this was the first day that I actually got to come out to the studio and work with Cheryl with the clay. I had been playing around with um, the idea of, of secret notes. You remember how when you were in school, and you wanted to pass a note, um, you would always fold it in a way that it would make a little knot. And if you passed it that way, nobody would be able to read it except the person to whom it was intended. So I had worked with these paper knots and I'd drawn these paper knots, but now it was time that I could actually go and make, um, make the clay knot version of it. You'll see stamped um, lots of letters. And um, y when you go back to the show or see the show again, all these are words, are their secrets, are their parts of words. Sometimes you'd never be able to distinguish what they are, but all the little indentations are actually letters. It was a fantastic day because um, uh, I couldn't uh, pick up the cell phone and I couldn't go to the computer. My hands were so covered in clay that all I could do was concentrate on the work. And it really gave me that jump start I needed to get, to get started again working. And I'm very grateful. I have very fond memories of that day in the studio with Cheryl. Um, 
you, you, um, I, I also made these uh, clay tags, and on that same day, I worked on the letters that you saw that are at the introduction to the show. And it was because of, of, of having this idea of making the words and then using those in the title of the show that um, we, we jumped to the idea of um, rearranging the letters to make other words. And um, I think if you look very hard up on the ceiling of the gallery on the rafters, you will see that there are two anagrams of the word borders of intimacy. One of them, Cheryl has titled her, uh, a piece that we'll talk about later called My Brides for Action. And um, we took parts of the anagrams, we took words that, that weren't using every single letter, but were using the letters of Borders of Intimacy to title many, many of the works in the show. So, um, so can do time. You can, you, can, you can spell can do time out of these words. And I did a lot of work digitally with those letters. I used, made some of those words and used them in some of the pictures um, as well. The, the, the idea of, 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 of using anagrams was um, something that I would like to present to you all right now. The title, Borders of Intimacy, if anybody can come up with another anagram using every single letter, we, it, Cheryl and I would feel that, that you had collaborated in the show as well, and we would be glad to give you credit. I gave a lecture at the San Diego Art Institute and made that same plea, and afterwards somebody came up to me and said, oh, nifty broad crimes. And that is what you will see written on the other rafter in the, in, the st in the studio. Those are both anagrams using the complete word. So it's an underlining, uh, underlying theme that runs throughout the show for both Cheryl and I. And we took great inspiration off of these words. Um, there's my brides for action. And um, this is a piece where you see the knots actually used in the piece. This is called Smart Magic. It, the words Smart Magic are actually stamped into the clay bits that are on either side of the frame. So I went so far as to actually use the clay on the frame from, um, and the images of the clay in the picture as well. Um, at this time, I'd like to just read um, a little quote that I found from um, from a man named Charles Saatchi, who is an advertising executive, but uh, runs a big, enormous gallery in London. He, he you know, um, after I worked with Cheryl, I was fortunate to go to London from March um, to May of last year, and I saw lots and lots of shows and got lots of references from the pieces which I will talk about tonight. And, um, and this uh, quote from him I thought was um, so very interesting, I wanted to share it with you tonight. He says, it's time to break out of the white cube space. It's time for a bit of a rethink about how works are installed in relation to each other, and even about how painting can be framed to help the public see them in a broader context. Most important, Museums should respect their audience and give up the ropes they are used to surround and effectively destroy so many works of art. And instead of spending millions on creating identical, austere, modernist palaces in every world city, they should actually use the money to buy some art. And I, I just really appreciated that statement and I really appreciate how um, Alessandra and Pat and her team of students helped us um, both together to, um, to take the ropes away and let you be able to really look at the work closely and, and to a certain extent out, uh, t turn that white box into a really warm and welcoming space. Um, I'm going just to go right into um, uh, talking about um, some, of the, um, some of the next works, but first I'm just going to show you a few more of the borders of intimacy. Um, I mean, I'm sorry, the sacred and profane pictures um, that were like that, that first lot. Um, these pictures all have to do with, um, um, this one particularly, the watcher, has to do with the idea of, you know, uh, again, is that watcher somebody that's watching over you and protecting you, or is that an evil figure that is about to pounce out and get you? 
so the, what, what we've done is we've sort of divided up the lecture um, into, into a series um, which we compare to a relationship. And um, Cheryl's going to be talking about couples, and this is one of the couples. A frequent thread in our work for Borders of Intimacy involved exploring relationships between couples. This involved working with themes of dualism, polarity, pairs, twins, Gemini. Tunnel vision shows two people joined cheek to cheek, wearing similar hats and goggles. The figures represent a couple at the turn of the century, driving one of the early Ford automobiles. The two figures are side by side and travel together. Tunnel vision represents a couple that have eyes only for each other, almost to the point of codependence. It was made in 2003 at Banff Center of the Arts, Alberta, Canada, and was actually the street that went by our artist's residency was called Tunnel Road. Another interpretation of this theme is that all of us have two or more identities within us. Norman Mailer spec speculates, what if there are not only two nostrils, two eyes, two lobes, and so forth, but two psyches as well, and they are separately equipped? They go through life like Siamese twins inside one person. They can be just a little different, like identical twins, or they could be vastly different, like good and evil. This theory could be behind the next work, Antibody, by Patricia Frischer, which shows a road leading to a mirror image couple. The two people are facing each other, projecting their lizard-like tongues toward each other in a spiral curve. Is it the breath of an intense internal conversation? The spiral tongue motif continues around the border of the painting, reiterating the theme. As Ralph Waldo Emerson says in May Day and other pieces, two well-assorted travelers use the highway, Eros and the Muse. From the twins, nothing is hidden. To the pair is not forbidden. Hand in hand the comrades go, every nook of nature through, each for the other they were born, and each can the other best adorn. Eros and the Muse. This is the couple from Spain. Uh, it was inspired by a visit to a hacienda in San Miguel, uh, de Ande. I was there for an artist residency uh, in summer of 2004. And uh, it was inspired by a trip to a hacienda that was built in 1600 and uh, a royal Spanish couple lived there and uh, had three daughters. And when it came time for the daughters to marry, husbands were imported from Spain and uh, were forced to take the family name so that the family could continue. And this place was so elegant and, and uh, had the atmosphere of the centuries. And it inspired this piece with Renaissance costumes uh, the tree, the family tree in the center of their necks. Uh, the story uh, is on the leaves of their hat. On the back of the piece, you see a spiral lacing joining the two families together. It also echoes some of the motifs in Patricia's work uh, if you look closely at her work, you'll, you'll notice cords and lacing. Uh, we played uh, a fun game uh, where we came up with words and uh, words that we were using in our research. Words like voyeurism, shadow box, handcuffs, clothing. And then we would suggest the next word that just came into our head. So, Voyeurism became eyes, and then became blind, and then became dog, and then we made sentences with that. 
One of these sentences was couple with spiral vine piercings. And so that directly influenced uh, the making of this piece. If you look closely around the edges of the picture in the uh, upper left, uh, you can see the spiral lacings in Patricia's work. A repetition of the motif of eyes and lips. Chrysler. We both uh, freely leafed through history and uh, borrowed uh, images from other periods of time. I remember the title of this one, Farts in Bed, which I think is a great title and it's one of the anagrams. You see some uh, political figures shaking hands and uh, some clowns. And this leads to the next part. This, this is the part of the talk where we talk right out about sex. <laughs> After we coupled together <laughs> with the last section, this is the sex, um, the sex discussion. And um, uh, Cheryl and I talked quite a lot about how um, in today's world with the advertising, there's a lot of skin showing without, um, without it necessarily being about sex. We talked about mini skirts and the advertisements for underwear on the television. And um, this, uh, the picture on the, the, my picture, which is called Showing Not Offering, was a result of many of those discussions. The actual model for the, the, um, for the um, figure in the middle of this picture is from a, a Gap ad. And in the Gap ad, the woman just is wearing underwear, and she has her thumbs just looped underneath the band of the underwear. So all I did was um, I used the same, uh, same technique of um, pretending that it was a magnifying glass that magnifies that one section of the picture to show um, what I wanted you to pay the most attention to. The, um, the picture is using um, a technique that I developed especially for this series of pictures. It's a technique where, um, where I've, I've used um, tracing paper and fine pencil lines to, to do the drawings. And once the drawings are finished, um, I've scanned them into my computer to be able to access them to do composition studies. And then I um, take the tracing paper with the, the pencil lines, um, the pencil marks on it that make the drawing, and I've had to spray them with a varnish in order to preserve them. Then I have to position them on the compositions with some sort of basically plain white background in order for you to be able to see the images, because remember they're on tracing paper, so they're pretty transparent. And so when I then attach them down, I use glue to attach them down. And when I did that, the picture, the, the, the exciting thing about it is that the tracing paper would completely wrinkle up and would become like this old, old thing, and it would look dreadful. But then over the course of sort of 24 hours, it would smooth itself out, and then it would reveal only a little bit of, the, of that sort of aged look that I was, um, that I was going for. So it was a, a real trial and error to discover that this was a particular type of process that I wanted to use for this picture. You, you probably recognize the background of this picture. It's a de Chirico um, setting, and I um, was very inspired by him um, because he did this background in about 40 of his pictures. And it's a, so, so for me to do a variation of it is just an homage to him. And usually set right in the middle on this pedestal in the middle would be his, um, his nude figure. So again, that's just a play on um, bringing that into my own world. Um, the, the small figures that you see just off to the back that are in, um, that are, that are in the original de Chirico are, are not his figures, but they're actually figures that I took out of a photograph by Whitney Lawson 
of a crowd scene that was looking at an exhibition at the Whitney Biennial. And I love the caption that went along with this photograph. Um, the caption was, celebrating a feckless youth who aimed to please. That was their comment about the Whitney Biennial. So that was, that was um, good fun. The next, the picture next to it is, um, is Cheryl's uh, flying lesson, the image of her sculpture. And um, I, I've, I've asked this question to a lot of people over the last couple of days, and that's, um, did you, do you, when you dream, do you ever dream that you're flying? Um, is there anybody in the audience that's dreamed that they've been flying? I mean, I think you're very fortunate, and when you read your, you know, young and your dream analysis books, um, flying is always about having sex. It's <laughs> in, in the dream state. And so um, Cheryl is not as um, obvious about um, the things that she, the comments that she makes in sex in her pictures, but I think this one is pretty overt to me, right? So the flying lesson, I think, was a good one to couple with this uh, showing, not offering. Um, in some of the instances, um, Cheryl's work is, is the, the more barriers to intimacy, and mine is the more blatant, but in this particular case, I think it's the other way around. Around. Um, I, I, I want to continue now, let's see, um, and talk just a little bit about this picture, which um, has the same, um, uh, some of the same imagery in it. This is certainly the same technique, and as you see, the lacing. Um, it's called Come Closer. And um, the images that you see that are oriental, I've had a fascination with oriental art for quite a long time. I, I know that uh, in, um, in Alessandra's introduction, she calls them the wedding book. I've always heard of it as the pillow book. And um, I think it's a really, um, it's a, a really good example of the difference of the sexual attitudes from the east to the west. In the, far, in the, in the east, especially in Japan, they think of the sexual acts as a natural thing that happens. And in fact, you know, you have to have good sex to have a healthy life. And in the West, of course, with the Victorian um, uh, um, strictures put upon us, you know, we have a much more hidden and um, uh, um, uh, uh, less free attitude about sex. But in, in Japan, no woman would, um, would ever um, have her education completed without her pillow book or her wedding book, which tells her about sexual positions and, how, you know, and, and, and everything that she would need to, to know um, about the sexual act. So um, I've taken that um, element and put it in my pictures, and I put it in in a way that I think is defining very much the difference between Western space and Eastern space as well. Um, the background of this picture is very much about um, uh, homes and houses, which Cheryl's going to talk about in a bit. It's very structured. It's very much about perspective, even in its abstractness. And the oriental um, way of thinking about space is, of course, not with that Western perspective. I, I remember being very inspired by a picture that I saw years and years and years ago of a beautiful oriental tree. And then inserted into this picture were little vignettes of different things happening. So that that's how I've used this to s insert little vignettes of things happening in the west in the in the eastern way of considering space as a non-linear process instead of the way that we think of, of of space in perspective or even in time as being linear this has just continued the theme but I, I, I did want to say a little, thing, a little bit about this in the next picture. When I was in London, I went to the Hayward Gallery and saw a stunning exhibition by, um, by Lichtenstein. And I was very impressed. Uh, time and time again, I go to exhibitions. And um, I think that, that what happens when you see really wonderful work is it somehow you can take something away that helps to validate your own work. And in this instance, um, in the Lichtenstein show, show, and you know that he's a pop artist and works with very bold pop images, 
um, it, this show was a huge retrospective and it went into the current time and he was doing very oriental landscapes that were so lovely that brought all the skill that he had uh, 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 managed to acquire about composition in pop art and brought him, brought him to this way of making the most lovely oriental landscapes. They still were Liechtenstein, but they had lost all that cartoon characteristic. And in fact, there were even places where there were real brush strokes of paint instead of the comic book brush strokes of paint that you see. And um, I, I, I somehow relate this in the next picture also because his humor was still there. This picture is called Girl with Tit. Um, and the, this, um, there was another exhibition that I went to see um, at the um, uh, Royal Academy of Vuillard exhibition. And um, we can never stop learning from Vuillard and his patterns and his textures. And Cheryl and I both relate very well to, the, to, to his pictures. The central candle flame in this picture is taken directly um, from a study that I made of one of his pictures. Uh, it was just so amazing with how, how, when you looked at it closely, how simply he made what is really a very difficult exercise to paint a candle flame is really kind of hard. So I'm very much indebted to him. There's another little uh, reference I want to point out in this picture. The man with the sunglasses on the left is actually a picture of, um, of Dennis Hopper, the actor. And it's a picture taken by uh, James Rosenquist. And what I do is I gather all these images, you know, that are that are just hit me as being interesting. And I don't know which ones are going to end up, how they're going to end up in the pictures, or how it's all going to go together. But so when you go to prepare a lecture like today, then all of a sudden you look back in your reference material, and everything seems to take on a delicious extra weight when you when you find out that you know, a bit of Rosenquist and Dennis Hopper is in your picture. Um, the, the man at the top right, uh, right, all the way at the top, also he's a figure that appears in many of the other pictures um, that you'll see uh, in the exhibition, is actually the painter Marsden Hartley, who of course was a, um, a sort of cubist and abstract expressionist from, you know, the 1930s into the 1950s, who at a point in his life decided to abandon all that and become a landscape and seascape painter and did lovely, lovely things, but made a complete about turn. And I feel in some ways, when you see the difference between the sacred and profane pictures earlier and these later pictures that I'm doing now, you know, there were a lot of people that were very fond of those colored pictures and to make the jump into doing something that looks quite dramatically different. Um, there were a lot of people that gave me the courage to, to go forward th with that. Some of them were living artists, some of them were dead artists. <laughs> they all, all sort of come together to help me to, to get to this point. That's the last. Um, I'm going to just uh, go through now with a segment that we call marriage. We've had couples, we've had sex, which of course in the night, in the, in the, 2006, 2005 comes before marriage. <laughs> and now I'm going to talk just a little bit about a few of these pictures, which are the marriage pictures. Um, Can Do Time is the one of mine that you see. And it's, you, you know, you can make a lot of obvious um, conclusions from this picture, but I think one that people don't naturally gravitate to, which Cheryl and I really talked about so much, was the idea of religion. I mean, this is why the hands are praying in this picture, and why I've shown a detail of Cheryl's bride, which is part of this picture, I mean, this sculpture, which is her Joan of Arc um, image, which she is called My Brides for Action. And it's so neat that she was working on this, this, this sculpture, and she w we came up with the My Brides for Action, and then she thought about how she could incorporate that into this, and that's why she put the bride in the back of this picture during the course of constructing it. And I don't think that would have happened without our collaboration, so I think that, that's, um, that was really very fulfilling for both of us. 
um, this picture I wanted to talk about a little bit more because of the clowns in, and, um, and the uh, relationship to, um, to the, um, the, the three segments here. On the first, uh, the bottom level, you see clowns that, um, that are very traditional clowns that um, when I went to work in London, I had lots of resource material that I had not seen for a few years that I pulled out and r really came back to me. And one of them was a book um, by um, Agnes de Mille about um, theater. And um, I found images of clowns in those books. The next level up you'll see are real people that I made into clown. The top picture is um, is actually of the artist Damien Hirst. Damien Hirst, as you probably all know, is the artist that did the sharks in the tank. And I consider him to be probably, you know, our star clown artist of the century. So that's how those um, three images came together. Cheryl, um, Cheryl, and I thought that these two pictures worked well together, the, the sculpture and the picture worked well together because of her clown figure, that this figure is actually a clown. And it ties in with the marriage because we see the side that is the man, but if you were to turn around the other side on the top, it is actually a woman as well. So it sort of symbolizes that, ties that back thing in together with the man and the woman. This, is, this uh, piece also is one that um, didn't actually make it into the show, but um, with the two figures and with the hand glass clasped together, we thought it also worked very well in this, um, in this segment um, when we're talking about praying hands and hands and rings and marriage and hands up. There is a sixth saying that once you know that God knows everything, you're free. Each of us has rooms in our heads that we keep closed and guarded as part of our social position. The guarding is energy and the makes the things real. Freedom lies in knowing that everything you were protecting isn't who you really are. The quote from Baba Ramdas. I like that quote because I use uh, many images of the house on top of the head and I think that we all have things that we protect or preserve or maybe keep secret in our heads. City Dwellers incorporates part of the figure, the heads into the sculpture of a building and it plays with the figure body metaphors. House as nest, house as relationships, the persona of the house, the body as a temple, house as cathedral, castle or cottage. In this sculpture, the title City Dwellers mean people who live or work in the tall towers that populate our downtowns. The people in the sculpture share close quarters as they look out their high windows gazing at the sky. The residents or the people who work together in these buildings are forced into a sort of intimacy because they're together in that building. Uh, maybe they meet, get married, uh, maybe they share a commute, a ride, uh, maybe they work on projects together, uh, maybe they share a, a lifetime of meals together. And uh, the, the building is the nest, the shell that holds all this life inside it. Patricia Frischer's Defy Borders shows a drawing of the city dweller's sculpture inside another building. The building looks like a guardhouse or a hut. Below the building, an oriental couple gazes at, at each other over the roof of another tiny building. Perhaps they are flirting with the idea of cohabiting together, or are they guarding their, heart, their hearts? This is Portals to the Past, again made in uh, San Miguel de Allende. And it's a city with much history. And as I walk through the streets of the city, I uh, admire the, the colors, the vibrant colors, the handmade windows, the handmade gates. Uh, there's also a secret quality to the buildings because uh, the doors are very ornate, but you don't see much of 
you don't know much about the people inside. If you go through the buildings, you see a beautiful courtyard, and there's, there's fountains, and uh, there's places to sit, there's music, there's flowers, and there's all this interior life. So I wanted to suggest that in, in this piece, and you actually see uh, one of the dwellers in the building on the side. This is uh, Tilting at Windmills. And uh, it's loosely based on uh, Don Quixote, the, the legend. And uh, he actually um, was either born or wrote in a city near San Miguel. And so they had uh, a lot of statues celebrating him. This is called Tilting at Windmills because uh, he's a heroic person. And uh, the lady on the top is in a canoe that's about to go down a waterfall, and he's out to rescue her. This piece of Patricia's shows a temple inside a temple. It's called Act on Time. One of the things I, I really uh, admired about Patricia's work was the way she was able to layer uh, different meanings into her work. And uh, she actually developed a new technique for this body of work uh, involving the, the stucco-like surface and the pastel colors, uh, which seemed to echo some of my colors and surfaces. Bedroom City, another anagram. This piece uh, by Patricia. Uh, plays with the idea of voyeurism and uh, Big Brother and, and, and echoes back to uh, your earlier piece that you showed with The Watcher. And uh, in, in modern days and times, it's almost like somebody's watching everywhere. You know, there's these little cameras in all the stores and uh, um, Big Brother on the computer, cookies following your uh, emails back and um, it's, it's part of our invasion of our privacy. It's sort of an invasion of our intimate nature. Bedroom City again. Do you want to say anything about the particular figures? They all have such a, an interesting link. <laughs> well, I think I've described them before from other things. Mm -hmm. But this is a good way to see the, the, the technique. Um, one thing I will say, the gray background uh, from these pieces all comes from um, really, really, really old wallpaper that was just out of the London flat that we had to use. And I couldn't bear to throw it away. So that what you're looking at is, you know, a gray that's been on paper that's been probably painted 40 times during years because it's a very old flat. And it was just a wonderful surface to work on. Mm -hmm. Part of the Bedroom City series. This was one that went through many changes. At first it looked more like wallpaper and then there were the figures um, that were working into it and uh, you got the idea of having them peep through almost like layers of the past being torn through. Some, somewhat like uh, billboards on a wall where you, you see the different layers peeking through posters. This is a secret keeper uh, in the exhibition and the, the keynote Borders of Intimacy piece. You'll see the clay letters, uh, these were photographed and then uh, altered in Photoshop and then uh, worked back into with mixed media. Secret Keeper shows the head and shoulders of a young woman. Her eyes are closed and a secret smile plays upon her lips. She looks almost like the cat that's eaten the cream. She's carved all over her face and shoulders with a wrapping that looks like fishnet or webbing. 
A tall collar suggests suggest a boat-shaped form. On her head is a gray safe with a yellow-green slot on the side. This is the place to slide in your secrets, which, which she will keep and hold for you. She knows all, but says nothing. Gallery visitors were invited to write a long-lost secret or a secret wish on the slip of paper and put it in the slot. As part of our continuing exhibition, which will travel to Oxford, England, we're going to look at the secrets and maybe get suggestions for newer works. This piece was inspired by a huge and heavy jewelry vault in the middle of a building reached, recently purchased by my husband and myself uh, for my studio, for art studios, and for a gallery. In the middle of a building was a vault as big as a person and weighing 2,000 pounds. It clogged the center of the building. You could hardly move around it. And uh, of course, it had been wonderful for the jewelry store, but I didn't need it. So I hired six men to tear it from the concrete wall, and it took days and uh, much effort and diamond saws to cut through the cement. And finally, it was gone. And I found two little postcards in the safe. No diamonds, just two postcards. They were from the 1950s, and one was from the French Riviera, and the other one was uh, from Seville. And uh, they were both addressed to the same man, I think somebody who worked there. And uh, one was from a man, and one was from a woman. And both of them were very um, amorous. So <laughs> that was the secret that was in the safe. <laughs> in the, the Borders of Intimacy painting, the words are spelled out in clay letters. Why pink open mouths whisper the secrets. Chinese lanterns dance across the top of the painting. Subtle images are interspersed behind the letters. I think you actually photograph some of my works and then uh, wrap them over paint cans or something and then rephotograph them. It tells us that love is a dance, a game of chance, a song without beginning or end, and that secrets whispered in the middle of the night will always, there'll always be some that are never voiced. A box full of secrets. Circle of Light, which is about group energy and sharing, but also with their closed position, uh, their wisdom figure, figures who are keeping their wisdom within. Blind Choice, not in the show, but actually in a previous show here at Mesa College. The secrets between uh, the man and the wife, the woman blindfolded, ready to leap, not knowing where she's going to leap. The dog figure weighing the choices. This is one of the collaborations we're working on now with the imagery. Um, you know, taking the show to Oxford, um, taking all those sculptures, the heavy ceramics to Oxford is problematic. And so Cheryl and I are going to spend the summer doing um, more collaborations of this sort as well um, with imageries and perhaps making banner sort of banner type pictures to show there. But using the sculpture, using the scul photographs of the sculpture, photographs of the work. So it's a very exciting time for us, I think, to, to continue this process. And I wanted to just show you one of the pieces that we w we've been working on in this uh, in this series. Um, and then I'm just going to end with this one final piece um, because I, as I started at the beginning, I said that it is um, it's it's up to you to say what you think about the piece and bring your own thoughts about the piece. So I've really tried to stay away from making interpretations of the art for you. 
But in this one case, I would like to talk about just a little bit about this piece, because um, it seems to um, grow with a little explanation. Um, this, um, the idea behind this piece is uh, very um, private. It's about when you take a shower and the glass mirror in the bathroom gets steamed up. And you can write a message on that mirror. And you can see the message, but then when the room cools down, the message disappears. But if you then go up to the mirror and breathe on it like that, like is shown in the film, then the secret is revealed again that you wrote. So that's what this, um, that's what this piece is, um, is really trying to express. Um, again, keeping secrets, having those secrets revealed, only letting those secrets out to the people that you want them to, to go out to. The, the part of it on the left, I'm going to leave to your interpretation, but I think that maybe um, every once in a while, like tonight, it is good for a few secrets to go out underneath the door and come out into the real world. And we hope um, that uh, you've enjoyed sharing some of the secrets that Cheryl and I have been enjoying um, <laughs> over the last two years. Um, thank you very much for coming this evening. We will take questions now, if there are questions. There was one piece we didn't talk about, um, which I did want to mention, called Double Dipping. It's the piece in the show that is the martini glass with the lips that you can see as if, you know, somebody is already drunk out of this glass. And um, Cheryl and I talked a lot about double dipping, and that's the reason why we had the dipping bar at the show tonight. Um, you know, this idea of, you know, how intimate do you have to be with somebody before you're going to double dip with them? <laughs> we all have our own sort of standards about what that's going to be. Um, mm -hmm. It's not sort of polite to double dip in public anymore. And we, it seems like people have, have learned that. Um, but um, that, that was But what do you do with the second half of the shrimp? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Right. Yeah, I have a question for Trisha. Mm -hmm. uh, your work is a lot about uh, your clowns incorporated in your work, and uh, so the motive, as I understand, it's like, uh, and you were talking about that, that some people have two faces and like a couple of natures, and Cheryl was talking about it too. So, is there something? Um, particular trigger yes, there is. It's, it's so interesting that you should ask that because I didn't remember to say that. Um, remember I told you that I had a lot of reference books and I went in and there was these pictures of these clowns that were documented in a book, a reference book that I had. And I started working on them. And I started working on them with great resistance because the last thing I wanted to do was have clowns in my work. It's such a cliche and it's so difficult and, you know, there's too many <laughs> terrible Emmett Kelly posters of clowns. And, but, you know, you do what you do as an artist. You just, you, you don't, you know, if you question too much what you do, you take out all the spontaneity. So I just kept working with the theme and trying to make it into my own. And, and that's why I took it in the direction that I took took it, making my own clowns out of various other people. Then right at the very end of the trip, and this was after I'd sort of given up and decided that the clowns were there to stay and there wasn't too much I could do about it, we went to France just for overnight and we met good friends of mine, um, a man that I respect very much, an old teacher of mine, and he said, um, I've arranged for a special exhibition for us to see and it's at the Grand Palais. And it was this wonderful exhibition called La Parade. And we walked into the door, and it was in a whole exhibition about the history of clowns in art. <laughs> from, from the greatest artist having painted clowns, all the way, I mean, in fact, there was so, it was such a huge exhibition, by the end of the exhibition, we were saying, you know, enough of bringing the clowns already, let's get out of here, you know? There were so many clowns and so many works, but it was really very interesting to see it all validated, you know, that, that, that they, that is a, a very ancient, ancient theme that runs throughout 
you know, um, uh, our civilization is, is clowns. So I, I, I think it, it, that then became, you know, mm -hmm. I, I just hope someday somebody doesn't look at my work and say, she went and saw that exhibition, then she put all those clowns into her pictures, because I'm telling you right now, that's not the way it worked. <laughs> It is Cheryl also, but uh, how come this the dog? Because you have dogs a lot in your work, like <laughs> this one that way. Does it have a special meaning to you? Yeah. In this one, the dog is the guardian. Okay. It's it's a guardian, uh, and it's based upon a medieval greyhound. Uh, they were larger, much larger than they are today. And uh, they were fierce hunters, and uh, this is guardian of her heart, and it's how we keep ourselves safe. Maybe we put up protection uh, against uh, giving everything away. How about the blind choices? There's the dog which waves. That has a direct uh, dog story that goes with it. Uh, my husband and I have a dog and a cat. And uh, the dog was his pet, and the cat was my pet, and the cat would sit upon the arm of the chair, and the dog would sit at his feet, and we would have our evening cocktail. And they were almost like our familiars or, or alter egos. Uh, so I did a number of pieces in which the, the dog was the man and the, the cat was the woman. Any more questions? No? They've been very patient. Yeah. They have. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Please don't you let me down. Yeah.